tonight we're going to be looking in 2 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we've been calling these, these last couple of weeks preparation for apostasy. And uh, we began this uh, study in this, in Peter's second letter. Let's see if I got this right. Chapter 1, if you remember, we read about the foundation of the faith, of our faith, and what we really need to be anchored in Jesus. Uh, if we're going to withstand the attacks of the enemy, you know, a lot of people have been under a lot of great attack from the enemy. Mentally, physically, spiritually, there's just been, it just seems like an onslaught. Not just here in this body, but just other, you know, pastors I know and believers I know. It's just been an onslaught. And Peter tells us in the very first chapter, we talk about that, about being diligent to add to our faith, knowledge, and our knowledge, you know, love. And he gave you, gave you that big long list of things, of virtues that we, that we grow in. That's how we establish our faith. That's how we're, that's how we're anchored. By reading God's Word, he said that it's God's Word that gives us the truth. And it's, we have to be just uh, immersed in God's Word every day. Because the Word is powerful. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We talked about that Sunday morning. Uh, in chapter 2, he talked about the attacks that would happen from within. And we talked about those who would creep in. Uh, false teachers, even as there were false prophets... In the Old Testament, there are false teachers in the church, and there were in Peter's day, and there are today, and there will be, I guess, until Jesus comes back. And the only way we can really be able to discern those false teachers is by being in God's Word, by being anchored in God's Word. If you don't know His Word, you're not going to know right from wrong. So it's important that we be anchored in His Word. He talked about the false prophets, their character, their agenda, their methods, and their judgment that will come upon them. That's what he talked about in chapter 2. Chapter 3 now, he's talking about what to expect from the world around us. The attacks from outside the camp. Outside the fortress. What are we going to be dealing with in the last days? The days we're living with. Uh, the return of Christ, we know, is the next thing to happen. In biblical prophecy, the, next, the, the imminent thing imminent with an I, not necessarily eminent. Eminent with an E means it's going to be like really soon. Imminent means next. It's the next thing to happen prophetically is, I believe, the rapture of the church. The trump will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. They lived in expectancy. The, the, the early church, they believed that Jesus could return any time. And they lived just like that. They, they encouraged one another to live. You know, Jesus can come back tomorrow. He can come back next week. He can come back in a minute. And they live that way. Well, this happened over thousands of years. People have kind of got uh, an attitude. Well, uh, in fact, what happened in the, in just right after the first couple centuries of the church, after the emperor Constantine became an emperor, and he, he embraced Christianity, although he never became a Christian. And Christianity, they like started forcing people to become Christians because that was like the thing to be. And uh, what happened was that instead of expecting the return of Christ, they figured, hey, this is it. So you have Augustine, and he wrote The City of God, and they began thinking that the, the kingdom of God was here. This is it. You know, well, this is a kingdom. It's not, not much of a kingdom. But, but that's what they began to believe. So through the, uh, the Dark Ages, when uh, the, the Catholic Church was the power, they believed that they were the kingdom of God, that that was it, that Jesus had come back in the person of the vicar of Christ, the, the Pope, the, the, the Church. The, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, of course. And that was uh, all through the years there were people who denied that. And of course, the process of Reformation, and that's history that we don't want to get into. But the, the days of the, the, the early church in the first century really aren't much different than they are today, except it's just a little, technically, it's a little different. They, we have a, a lot more technical things. Uh, and we have a lot more, uh, quote-unquote, science we have uh, different areas by which they can attack our faith. And that's really what Peter was dealing with in this last chapter. Listen to this guy. Why are you not a Christian? Because I see no evidence whatever for any of the Christian dogmas. Now, it was kind of hard to hear. This, this guy is a guy named um, 
Bertrand Russell. How many have ever heard that name, Bertrand Russell? He was, he was thought of one of the great thinkers of the 20th century. <clears throat> he was a mathematician and a philosopher. He was also a libertine. He believed in free love and free sex and all that stuff. He was kind of like a wild guy. But he, what he said there, and it was, it was a little, the, the audio is kind of hard to hear. The, the, the interviewer asked him, well, you know, why don't you believe, because he was very openly atheistic. And they said, why don't you believe in, in God? And he said, basically, there's no evidence. There's no evidence. Well, the Bible says evidence is all over the place. But see, this is the attack from the outside. This is what Peter's talking about here in this chapter. The attack on our faith in the Creator. We were created in His image, weren't we? I always thought we were created in His image. That's what the Word tells us. But here's what they believe today. Now, some of these clips I've got from uh, some, some, some uh, like Discovery Channel and Science Channel. Uh, this next fella is a, uh, uh, one of the fellows here is, is, is a guy named Neil Tyson. I'll talk, we'll talk about that whenever we get here. It's expanded. Okay. Its temperature dropped. In some areas, galaxies formed. Within them, smaller clouds of hydrogen and helium gas collapsed to form the first stars. The universe began to fill with light. When the stars burnt up their fuel, they blew up in a tremendous explosion called a supernova. Throwing new elements like oxygen and carbon out into space. This dust from the stars is spread around the universe. It formed the planets, including the Earth. You, me, and even my wheelchair are made of stardust. Recognize that the very molecules that make up your body, the atoms that construct the molecules, are traceable to the crucibles that were once the centers of high-mass stars that exploded their chemically enriched guts into the galaxy, enriching pristine gas clouds with the chemistry of life so that we're all connected to each other biologically to the earth chemically and to the rest of the universe atomically that's kind of cool that makes me smile and I actually feel quite large at the end of that it's not that we are better than the universe we're part of the universe we're in the universe, and the universe is in us. The Bible says that God is in all things and <laughs> through all things. It? They see what they've done. And, and the first person you saw there, some of you might not know that, that's, it's a fellow named Stephen Hawking. And he is like the, he's, uh, and the second guy is a guy named Neil Tyson. And these are like the, these are like the, the, uh, the scientific heavyweights today. At one time it was like Carl Sagan, and he's passed away, but now these guys have taken his place. And these, these guys are brilliant, they, they're, you know, brilliant minds. They're, they're, they, they're educated, they're doctors of a, uh, astrophysicism, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word is. They're astrophysicists, is what they are, okay. Uh, they study the universe and the galaxies, and they study the stars, and, they, and, they, and they're, they're brilliant. They, they have, probably have IQs greater than, you know, any four of us put together. They're, they're geniuses. But the Bible says they're fools because they have allowed themselves to believe the lie that there is no God. Peter writes, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Peter said, I want to, I want to remind you of something. I've told you about what our foundation needs to be. i told you about the attacks that's coming from within. But I want to remind you of what's going to be happening in the world and the culture around you. You may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Now, we've seen this in our time. Uh, when Peter was writing this, he used the, 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 the word last in the last days. 
that word es eschatos, eschatology, the end of the end. He's talking about the end of the age. In the end of the age, there are, there's always been scoffers. But in the end of the age, we will see a tremendous amount uh, and a, a tremendous attack upon uh, God's word. Uh, the, some manuscripts use, use the words in mockery. They mock God. They mock... Now, now uh, their purpose is to ridicule any religious thought and those that possess it. They walk after their own lust. If you would go up to some of the gentlemen that we uh, saw in that last clip and say, well, listen, I believe in God, they would mock you. And just, just to get an idea, here's Mr. Tyson again, Dr. Tyson, in, uh, in this fast clip. tirade on stupid design, and uh, this will be fast. Uh, look at all the things that just want to kill us, okay? Uh, most planet orbits are unstable. Uh, star formation is completely inefficient. Most places in the universe will kill life instantly. Instantly. The people that say, oh, the forces of nature are just right for life. Excuse me. <laughs> just look at the volume of the universe where you can't live. You will die instantly. That is not, that's, not, that's not what I call the Garden of Eden, all right? Uh, uh, galaxy orbits that we orbit once every couple hundred million years, you're bound to come close to a supernova that will wipe out your ozone layer and kill everybody on the surface who doesn't otherwise have dark skin because your high energy rays will give you skin cancer. Um, we're on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. Gone is this beautiful spiral that we have. And of course, we're on a one way expanding universe as we wind down to oblivion as the temperature of the universe asymptotically pro approaches absolute zero. That's the universe. Then Earth, volcanoes, a tsunami just killed, uh, you know, I think that number's higher, up 200,000 people, floods, tornadoes. None of this is any sign that there's a benevolent anything out there. And this 90% is, should be 99%, as was earlier noted, that's a, um, of all life that has ever lived is now extinct. Inner solar system is a shooting gallery, comets, uh, uh, asteroids, duck. Um, and look how long it took to make multicellular life. Not from the beginning of the earth. Life happened quickly, but not multicellular life. Uh, you needed your cyanobacteria to sort of crank on the oxygen, get the oxygen budget going. Then you could have sort of, uh, that's sort of rocket fuel for multicellular creatures. But that took three and a half billion years. That's hardly an efficient plan with us in mind. Um, and in human beings, this is like the most tragic of them. I don't even include here the expression of free will where people want to kill each other. I'm talking about nature killing us without the help of human beings. Aggressive childhood leukemia, hemophilia, all of this, all of this. And we so much praise about the human eye, but anyone who's seen the full breadth of the electromagnetic spectrum will recognize how blind we are, okay? And part of that blindness means we can't see, we, we can't detect magnetic fields, ionizing radiation, radon. We are like sitting ducks for, for ionizing radiation. Um, we have to eat constantly because we're warm-blooded? Crocodile eat a chicken a month, it's fine, okay? So we're always looking for food. These gases at the bottom, you can't smell them, taste them, you breathe them in, you're dead, okay? <laughs> so, I'm almost done, I'm sorry, I'm taking up your time here. So, so, and with the birth defects, most are unknown. Look at this. Others, we, it's like abuse and infection and stuff that human beings have something to do with. Here's, we have no idea. Oops, I pushed a button by accident, sorry. No idea. My favorite of all is, of no. course, you eat, breathe, eat, and drink through the same hole in your body, guaranteeing that some percent of, our, of us will choke to death every year, okay? Imagine if you had a separate hole for breathing and eating and talking. That would be just really cool, right? <laughs> it was just, you could drink, breathe, and just talk and you would never choke, all right? And it's not, it's not a hard request. Dolphins breathe and eat through different holes in their body. And that's a mammal. So I'm not asking, I'm not, you know, this is like Santa Claus could bring this one. Um, they make a mockery. Did you, did you hear what he was saying? God, God didn't do, you mean God created us like this? He could have done a better job than this. That's what he's saying. Of course, one thing he doesn't, he, he would never acknowledge, is the reason why we have all that problems is because of sin. Because of man, so they don't like to talk about that. So they don't like to say that, you know, everything, God did make everything right until sin entered in. But you see, this is, you know, our kids, we, we, we raise them up, 
in church and we teach them about God and we teach them the truth of the word and they graduate and we send them off to college and they get a guy like this a guy that has a doctorate a guy that is you know an intelligent brilliant man and that's why so many kids if we don't equip them with what with what the truth is and what God's word says they'll go to college and they'll hear somebody like this and they'll just jump they'll just jump right off the bandwagon because these guys can be very convincing if you don't know the truth they'll make a mockery Peter says there will be scoffers that's a scoffer here's a guy that's a brilliant he has a brilliant mind but he's a scoffer because he believed a lie he didn't believe God's word so he made a mockery of God he made he made, he actually he, he said God if, if there's a God that created us but he didn't do a very good job of it that's what he said well the word tells me something different okay Peter says that these mockers will come and they'll say where is he? Where's God? Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. This is what they say. They say, well, where is he? If there's a God, how come, how come there's evil in the world? How come babies die? How come people get sick? How, they, they, they bring up all this, all this stuff. If they would read God's word, there's an explanation for all of that in here. You know, he explains it all. But they don't want to take the time to read in the study. They think this book is just, a, is just a, a fairy tale. It's folklore. But what they do believe, they believe, and in, 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 again, he's speaking here about creation, and we'll see that in the next couple verses. <clears throat> but they, of course, they believe, in, and the assault in the last 150 years, of course, has been the theory of evolution. Okay? Now, the theory of evolution is not the first... Uh, Darwin's theory is not the first theory of evolution. In the, the ancient Greeks, Aristotle believed there was a tree of life. There were different, different ideas of, of, about evolution, but Darwin kind of quantified everything. But, of course, we've all heard the term, the Big Bang. We've all heard that, haven't we? Because when, you, when, you, when they start talking about evolution, they start talking about animals, species changing, and you, and you bring them back and say, well, what, you know, where did it all begin? Where did it all begin? The Big Bang. Now, until the early 20th century, okay, uh, and, and there was a lot about this, but I don't want to get, get a lot of clips, but until the 20th century, most scientists believed that the universe was just there. That it never had a beginning. That it just always was. Because it was big, and there was only so much they could see of it, and they just figured it was always there. But in the early 1900s, a fellow named Edward Hubble, who they named the Hubble Telescope after Edward Hubble, so he was pretty pretty important guy. He discovered through, he was, again, he was an astronomer. He, dis, he discovered that the universe is expanding. That, that, that through, you know, measurements and so forth that the things are, it's, they're, they're, everything's moving away from each other. Well, that was a pretty interesting discovery because what that meant was if the universe was expanding, there must have been a time when it was contracted. You know, if everything's moving out this way, there must have been a time when it it was back here. So that, that presented a problem to astronomers and astrophysicists and so forth. That presented a problem to them. Again, uh, in, this, in this next clip, we, we hear Stephen Hawking and some other ones. Uh. If the universe had always been expanding and you traced its progress back in time, then the early universe had started very small. The universe may even have had a beginning. A moment of creation. Despite Hubble's discovery, nearly all scientists ignored the question of what had happened at the beginning of the universe. The problem seemed too difficult to tackle. But after World War II, a small group of nuclear physicists began to take the idea seriously and tried to imagine the conditions at the beginning of the expansion. The man who led this quest was the Russian exile, George Gamow. He was a nuclear physicist, well known for his imaginative ideas, wonderful insight, but never got a calculation right in his life, as far as I know. And he came up with the wonderful idea that the early universe might have been very hot. Gamow 
Asimov considered the possibility that the early universe closely resembled an exploding atomic bomb. It was very hot and very dense. As the universe expanded, it would cool and create the basic elements of nature, such as hydrogen and helium. But his theory wasn't taken very seriously. His opponents dubbed it the Big Bang Theory. I became interested in the Big Bang Theory shortly after I came to Cambridge in the early 1960s. At that time, many scientists were still instinctively opposed to the idea that the universe had a beginning. They felt that a point of creation would be a place where the laws of science broke down and one had to appeal to religion and the hand of God to determine how the universe would start. You're really saying? This isn't coming from Answers in Genesis. This isn't coming from a Christian. What he's saying was when, they, when this one fella came up with the idea of the Big Bang, that wasn't like you know, a discovery. That was just a thought. He imagined it. He, says, he, 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 he had a good imagination. Could not get a calculation right according to that one guy, but he had a good imagination. But he, he's the one that came up with the Big Bang. And initially, that, the term Big Bang was a, a term of derision. They, they used that to, to put it down. And what, what Stephen Hawking is saying is, initially scientists rejected it because if they were to accept that, that means they would have to admit that, that it had a beginning. And, it, and they would have to maybe even think about the possibility that maybe there's a creator. So they rejected it until they started coming up with all kinds of different ideas. And they came up with the idea, well, you know, uh, maybe it just, you know, everything just came from nothing by accident. That's basically what they're saying. And now they're coming up with ideas about parallel universes and everything. And now they're coming, but they can't, they can't use the word creator. It's against their, it's against their religion. Because it really is a religion. Okay? Now I'm showing you all this stuff so you, you can understand. What Peter is saying here is so pertinent to today. As much as it was back in his day. Even more so. Because all the stuff we hear about the Big Bang and all this stuff. It's all made up. It's all imagination. One guy comes up with an idea and then a whole scientific community, uh, community over decades decides they're going to get behind this idea because uh, you know, it's expanding, it had to have a start, but we better come up with some reason why it had to have a start because if we can't, then they're going to say that there's a God. We can't have that. See, folks think that science proves there's no God. And a lot of these kids go to college and they'll get these professors and they'll say, well, science has proved... Science hasn't proved anything. Real science, the true science... Looks at, looks at nature and experiments and is open to anything. Science falsely so-called says that there's no God. And that's what we're dealing with. And that's what Peter's talking about. That's the attack on our faith from the outside. They send salvos of scientific quote-unquote information against us. Wanting us to believe that the stuff that we believe here is nothing but just a lot of, a lot of you know, uh, folklore, superstition. In reality... They've made it up. They've made it all up. Evolution. They've made it up. It, it's, it's, it's theories based upon the idea that there's no creator. They start with the idea of no creator. For this, they willingly are ignorant of. They willingly reject the idea that there is an intelligent designer, a creator. They'll mock him. They'll, they'll, make, uh, they'll make jokes about him. They'll, they'll, they'll mock anybody that would even start to believe that, that there's a God that created everything. Why? Because they cannot accept the fact that there's a supernatural God that's going to hold them accountable for their behavior. They are willingly ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, this is what Peter's describing. The creation of the earth. The creation of all things. The creation of light, the creation of the planets, the creation of the stars. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. These men deny that there's a creator. They deny that everything has been created by the word of God. They deny 
that there's, there was a judgment, we believe, in the flood of Noah. You read about it in Genesis. If you talk to, if you mention the word flood, you know, if, 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 if you watch, again, watch these programs, these scientific programs, they always talk about some kind of cataclysmic uh, uh, event in geological history. They'll never say the word flood. They'll never say flood. They'll say an asteroid hit. They'll say, um, I say, they, they, you know, but some, one, a sudden catastrophic e event. They have, they found mastodons frozen in the northern parts of the, of the world with food in their stomach. So that means it didn't happen over a period of like a couple million years. There was one catastrophic event. When we, when we were going through the book of Genesis, we talked about the flood. And how before the flood, the, the, the earth was like a big greenhouse. Everything was, was temperate and the climate was just really nice all over the place. And when, when the water be, uh, started to fall and, 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 and God changed the climate, that's what uh, designed the, you know, the zones of the earth. It's cold at the poles and warm in the middle. That's when that began. Up, up until that time, it, it probably the whole earth was probably temperate because it was like a big uh, you know, uh, terrarium. So after the flood... You know, things change. They're, they're ignorant of that. They won't say anything about a flood. They know there's, you know, they'll go through geological ages and so forth and say it's 14 billion and all this age. But they won't admit to a flood. And not only that, and, and ultimately, they deny, they're willingly ignorant that there's going to come a time when God's going to judge the ungodly. See, this is why they can't, they can't own, they can't believe in a God. Because if they believe in a God, God's going to hold them accountable. Just like he holds us accountable. Just like he's going to hold everybody accountable. Everybody's going to stand in front of God. The Bible says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. I thank God for, as a believer, my judgment was on the cross. My judgment was taken by Jesus Christ. I'm going to die someday, but my judgment has already been accomplished. Now my works will be judged. And, and we talk about the judgment seat of Christ and so forth. But when it comes to salvation... I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Because why? Because Jesus died on the cross. I've, I've, I've come to the cross. I've, I've, I've surrendered to him. They don't want to do that. People in general don't want to do that. So Peter is telling us about what is going on here. He says... As you um, approach the uh, end of life, do you have any fear of some kind of afterlife? Or do you feel that that is just an no, impossibility? No, no, I think that's nonsense. There is no afterlife. None, whatever. Nonsense. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, afterlife, it's nonsense. What happens when we die? Nothing. We die. We're, we're done. How can they, if you look at human beings, see, the fact that, that we're the only creature on the face of this earth that even has an idea that there is a supernatural, okay, where did that come from? If we're just evolved from monkeys, if we're just animals that got brains, where did we get the idea that there's a supernatural, a, a supreme being, a God? Because everywhere you go, in all, in all cultures, they have some kind of supernatural reality. They, they believe in something supernatural. Where did it come from? Peter says this, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What these people don't understand is the reason why God is, is holding back his wrath is for their sake. It's God's mercy why he hasn't sent his judgment on this planet yet. It's his mercy. You know, I was, I was looking at different clips, and I, I was on YouTube watching clips for this. Which I, re I really got, like, overburdened watching some of these clips I did. I've said, man, I, maybe I should go without them, but I, I just want to include some of these. But, you know, I, I saw a, a clip of Carl Sagan, and again, we've, we've seen him here before. Uh, Carl Sagan, with his last interview, because he, he passed away in, with cancer, I think in, like, 97. I'm not sure of the year, or 99, but it was his last interview, and I was watching it. I was saying, how tragic. Again, here's a guy with a brilliant mind. A great communicator. Uh, probably a good guy. You know, I don't know. He had a family, wife, kids. Yet, he denied, you know, God gave him t 
time, chance after chance. I wonder how many people wrote Carl Sagan letters and said, Carl Sagan, you ought to believe in Jesus. He probably laughed them off. He probably scoffed at them. He probably mocked at them. I guarantee you, and I believe this with all my heart, and I'm not saying this with any kind of glee, but I'm, I, I guarantee you that Carl Sagan believes in, in God right now. And he will for all eternity. It's not a good thing. These people were listening to Bertrand Russell. I, I guarantee you he believes, he might have thought it was nonsense while he was living, but he doesn't think it's nonsense now. Because the Bible tells us we're all going to live forever somewhere. That's what God's Word says. We all live forever somewhere in our body. See, someday the dead in Christ are going to rise, and someday these, these ones who've passed away that don't believe, their bodies are going to rise too. And they're going to have to stand in front of a great white throne and give account for their lives. You see, it's not nonsense. The Word tells us that we live forever, somewhere. They are, am I going the wrong way? Okay, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works therein shall be burned up. This is very similar to what the Apostle Paul said in First Thessalonians chapter 5. The day is coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back for His church. He's coming back to make all things new. He's coming back to, to, pay, to pay off every debt. He's coming back to make everything right that has been made wrong because of sin. We read about it again. God's Word is so clear, it's not confusing, it's not difficult to understand. That Jesus Christ is coming back not as a babe in a manger, but He's coming back as a conquering King. And He's going to come back for, for His church, for His bride. He's going to catch us away to be with Him forever in heaven. And then the judgment will come. And then the tribulation will come. He goes on, He says, Seeing then, that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be? Now see, he started his letter by encouraging us to live godly life. He, uh, he, he said in the very first chapter, he said, we're given everything we need to live godly lives, to live holy, to be the people that God wants us to be. And he ends his letter by encouraging us that we need what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness. You see, the, the, the attacks from within and the attacks from without, really, we can, we can shrug them off as long as we're rooted and grounded in God's Word. If all these things are happening, how important is it for Christians, for people who are followers of Jesus Christ, to determine that they are going to live their lives reflecting who He is? seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. You know, the time is coming when all this stuff around us is just going to melt. All the stuff, the stuff that we've held so dear, this, all the things that we think are so important to us, it's all going to melt away. They talk about the Big Bang. There's a Big Bang coming. It didn't start with a Big Bang. It started with the Word of God, but there's a Big Bang coming. And see, and, and I always like to say, we talk about you know nuclear war and everything. When God does it, He's not going to use our bombs. All He has to do is speak the Word. And there'll be a Big Bang. They'll melt with fervent heat. He says, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. You see, His... His children, his, the followers of Jesus. We're looking for something better than this. Because we know that all this stuff is going on now because of sin. But God has promised us a better, a better thing. He ends his letter the same way he started. Exhorting us to holiness and godliness. We expect destruction by fire. And we expect a new heaven and a new earth. This is coming. It's promised. It's something that we have, to, we have to hold on to. Because when we, when we get up against some of, these, some of these ones who will rail against our faith, we need to stand firm on His Word. It's not superstition. It's God's Word. It's what He's promised us. It's what He's told us. It says, 
Wherein, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent. There's that word again. He started off his letter by saying, be diligent. And he ends his letter by saying, be diligent. I guess that means that we have to be diligent. I guess that means that we have to make the effort to live this life that's glorifying to God. He says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Saints, we need to constantly examine ourselves in the light of all these attacks. If you're not, if you're not rooted, if you're not grounded, if you're not living in holiness, when you come up against the, 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 the enemy from within, and you come up against the enemy that's without, you're going to be shaken. You have to be shaken. Some of these people that we saw here tonight, they're very, very good at attacking your faith. They're very good at, at trying to convince you that what you believe in is a lie. But I'm here to encourage you tonight. You need to be diligent. Press your way into this Word. Get into, this, get into God's Word. Study. Don't just read it. Study it. Eat it every day. Make it a part of who you are and what you are. And you'll be able to stand against you. Know, those, I'm, I'm telling you what, these guys, they don't impress me. Kind of make me mad. You know, I don't like people mocking my guts. You know, I don't, it, 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 makes me, it makes me angry that they would make a mockery out of the God that died on the cross for them. It makes me angry. We pray for them. We pray for them, okay? And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, he refers to the Apostle Paul here. Some folks, you know, talk about Scripture. He, he says that Paul's letters are Scripture. He says, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, but which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. People take things and they twist them out of, you know, they take the word and twist it any way they want to to make it say what they want it to say. But God's word is sure. He goes on and he says, You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things, before, beware lest also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. We need, listen, we need to, we need to anchor ourselves. We cannot, we can't just rest on our laurel. We just can't rest on what we, what we know or what we think we know. It's a constant everyday battle to be diligent, to press your way in. And I find, I find the enemy attacking people, trying to make people weary, trying to make people doubtful, trying to make people just sit back and, oh, you know. We, listen, we need to shake that off. We need to press our way. He says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be both glory, both now and forever. Beware, grow in grace, and grow in knowledge. That's what Peter leaves us with. That's what we need. You can reject. Listen, I don't care. You might not have a, a 12th grade education. If you have real faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross, you're in better shape than these guys that have doctorates. You might not have an IQ that's much above anything. It doesn't matter. You don't need an IQ. I mean, if you do got one, thank God for it. If you got intelligence, thank God for it. If you got an education, thank God for it. That's great. But the most important thing you can know, because it's eternal, is what this word says. And if you get yourself anchored in here, then you can go up against a PhD. You can go sit and listen to a, a, a doctor of philosophy who will tell you that what you believe is not true. But if you're anchored in here, you'll know it's true. Because God's word, it's not just something we read and put down. It's not a textbook. It's a word that touches us on the inside. Beware. Grow in grace and grow in knowledge. And he says, the Lord be with you. So I hope and pray that these last couple weeks we've just been talking a little bit about things that we're, we're facing today in 2011 and we'll be facing until Christ returns. That we would be anchored in the truth. In the name of Jesus. Amen.